Hello, everyone. I have my friend Daniel here today, and we're going to talk about some fun app that he built uh, with automator action type uh, <laughs> skills. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. But first thing I want to talk about is uh, when did you start first using a Mac and start developing on one? Yeah. Um... Let's see, so I started first using a Mac in, I think about 2006, uh, I was on Tiger. I got one of those iMacs that had the, just, it was it was all white with the, the nice gray logo right there in the middle. I, I loved that thing. I got super into my Mac, um, uh, spent you know weeks exploring every little menu and button in every app. Um, so yeah, that was about 2006. And then uh, um, I actually, the, the the year after that, I was, I was in high school. Um, I took AP Computer Science. Um, uh, Funny side story there. I, I thought I had signed up for a graphics course. I, I oh, thought nice. this was going to be about Photoshop, and turns out it was it was programming. So I stumbled upon my career, um, but that was that was lucky. Um, Can't so, about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I uh, yeah I took an AP Computer Science class and you know got really into programming, and uh, shortly thereafter um, Apple uh, opened up the App Store and and you know opened up their their platform to developers. And um, around that time, maybe again, this was a few months later. Stanford had put out a class, uh, I think, taught by Evan Dahl, who was who was formerly at Apple, um, and it was this online class um, about iOS development. Um, and I I watched this because I was just interested in anything Mac or iPhone related. Uh, I was I was just you know hungry for all of that stuff. Uh, I never really intended to develop for the iPhone. I just I thought it was cool. Um, but after a few a few lessons of that, seeing Interface Builder in particular, how you could visually lay out an app and right click and drag from a button to somewhere in your code to hook up an action. I mean, that just blew my mind. And uh, eventually I decided I just had to start developing for the iPhone. So um, uh, a friend and I, actually the same friend that I, I built this app um, that you know we'll talk about later today, uh, it's, it's that same friend. He and I started developing a few apps, published a few in high school um, and, and early college for us. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, started out with iOS, and then just in the past year or so, he and I have been working on this this Mac app together. Um, and luckily, many of those skills are transferable. So uh, sure, yeah. So out of curiosity, when you were first, uh, you were obviously learning computer science before you were doing iOS stuff. So what was kind of your main interest, I guess, at that point? Like, did you were you developing things before you were working on iOS at all, or? No, not really. Uh, just what I had done in this, you know, this APCS class. Um, so I, yeah, I hadn't done anything really independently of that. Um, cool. So iOS was my first foray to into, you know, an actual project that I worked on for more than a week or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I do agree. The I think the interface builder aspect was probably one of the neatest things. I, I remember early on just remembering that the fact that it was a distinct application and the fact that you could drag that line between Yes. The one application and the other that just yes. like blew my mind. I'm like, how do what? they do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little less magical now because you're like in the app, the same app. But uh, yeah. yeah, I remember I was like, wow, how are they doing yeah. that? Anyway, um, <laughs> cool. So uh, I kind of looked at some of your other projects that you have as well on your main website anyway, and uh, you have uh, quite a few various projects that you've worked on. I'm just kind of yeah. curious if you have a a favorite one aside from the app that we're going to talk about today that. Um, you, you really liked? Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, up until about a year ago, I was I was really a web dev. So when I went into college, I, I, I got a job working for a professor of mine, actually, who had just started a company. And, and that was all just full stack web development. So really, for the past six or seven years, I, you know, became a web developer. I didn't really touch iOS. And I had always stayed interesting, like, or interested, excuse me. Um, so I followed a bunch of blogs and stuff and, you know, watched a bunch of YouTube videos, iOS and 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 Swift and Objective-C always interested me. But um, yeah, I became a web developer. So most of those projects you saw were all web related. Um, uh, yeah, I think the, the project I'm, I'm probably proudest of there um, is uh, something called OrgWeb. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a really big Emacs user. Um, I, I even use Emacs to do all my iOS and, and um, Mac development. Um, oh, wow. So Xcode is just a place I go to, to you know, compile and, and run. Um, it's dedication. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've got a few, you know, tricks up my sleeve too to make that, that a little bit more uh, easy to work with. But um, yeah, so I was a big user of uh, something you may have heard of called Org Mode, um, which is this, this um, sort of to-do list app and calendar and a bunch of other things built right into Emacs. And a lot of Emacs users are really into it. Um, I'm very into it, use it to 
organized my life and um, I was missing a way to access uh, this this file, this app in, in a way from my phone. So um, I built uh, a, a website that was really intended for mobile use only um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to access this org mode file. And um, this ended up being like, it was clearly a need by the Emacs community. So um, it, it's gotten pretty big. It's got like over a thousand stars on GitHub, which is really right. cool. I never expected yeah. to do anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of folks seem to seem to really like it. Um, so I'm I'm pretty proud of that. Pretty pretty happy awesome. with that project. Yeah. Awesome. So are you mainly doing uh, Mac development now, or are you uh, like are you also still doing web dev stuff? Or um... yeah, right now um, my friend and I are focusing on this on this one app. Um, uh, we're, we're kind of doing a slow release right now, launching through through various sources. So we're we're really focused on that, and it's just a Mac app. Um, there are a few backend related things to deal with license keys and and payment processing and you know stuff sure. like that. But um, yeah, right now we're we're just focused on this Mac app. Cool. Is yeah. there any Swift related backend stuff that I should be aware of, or was no. it mainly just? A <laughs> I, I wish. That's something I'm very interested in. Um, I definitely love Swift, and um, I'm like all aboard the Swift train, and would love to use it everywhere. But uh, you know, for the few things we needed on the back end, it just didn't seem worth the time to to learn Vapor or whatever the 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 new hotness is for you know Swift sure. on the back end now. So um, one yeah. day though, yeah, yeah, it changes. It, I mean, at least for a long time, it pretty much changed completely every year while Swift was evolving too. So yeah, uh, I don't think you, I don't think you missed. Yeah, I don't think you missed too much on the yeah <laughs> trying to be early on the bandwagon. But um, yeah. cool. All right, so one kind of transitioning into the app that we wanted to talk about today, I. I couldn't help but think that it was very close to uh, Automator's uh, Record Me actions. And so yeah. I, I had a feeling you must have had some inspiration there. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe you want to talk about your uh, interest in Automator, perhaps, or uh, what, what your goal is. And you can just transition to what your app uh, cool. effectively does. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, funnily enough, Automator wasn't really the inspiration. We uh, we had known about Automator for a while, but only later discovered like, oh, hey, it's got this similar recording feature. Um, but briefly, just to, to set the stage, um, yeah, Keysmith is an app that um, lets you automate you know, workflows, uh, and it does this by recording what you do, and then it will play them back, and you can like assign a keyboard shortcut and, and, and things like that. Um, but actually, the inspiration was uh, a, a task that my my girlfriend had to do. She she came home from work uh, one day. She she works or worked in like an HR department somewhere, and her boss had given her this task to do that would have taken her hours. And um, it was highly repetitive. Had to do with like sorting through a spreadsheet and and taking an action for each item in the spreadsheet. And um, uh, she wasn't like looking for a solution. She was just like complaining about this horrible task she had to do. And I said, Oh, yeah, I actually know of a tool that might make this easier. Um, and that tool was actually Keyboard Maestro. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, yep. Keyboard Maestro. It's another yeah popular Mac app, kind of similar. Um, so we spent a while trying to build a Keyboard Maestro, uh, Keyboard Maestro, excuse me, macro to sort of accomplish this task for her. And we were successful eventually, um, but it was very hard to do. And we, you know, there were lots of bugs in this macro and lots of little gotchas, and um, it just proved to be to be very difficult. Um, but uh, my friend and I talked about this later and realized that, oh, hey, there's there's probably something here. People have these tasks they want to automate, and and there's got to be something easier than, you know, Keyboard Maestro. Um, and yeah, like I said, we, we later discovered, oh, Automator has this record feature that's very similar. Um, not quite as like powerful in some ways, and that's something we focused on a lot is, is like a lot of heuristics for uh, making it more powerful for common applications. Um, uh, but yes, it is it is very similar to to yeah, Mac OS is built in automator app for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that one. So uh, my own story for uh, at least why uh, I've, I've worked with automator and worked with Apple script in particular was um, so my uncle, he basically every uh, week or every day or whatever, he downloads a CSV file and he always mm -hmm. wanted it formatted basically into this particular thing with yeah. uh, certain formulas and highlighting and stuff. And, uh, so I was like, well, you know, I can I can delete and add rows and stuff using. So basically, Numbers has Apple Script support that you right. can basically insert, remove, and do a bunch of various things with it. Uh, the one tricky part came though at the very end where he wanted to do certain highlighting on cells, and this isn't really exposed in the Apple Script functionality of mm -hmm. Numbers, at least not documented anyway. And um, 
and so one way you can effectively do this is uh, kind of like what your app does, right? Where you yeah. can navigate through the UI to effectively do that. And yep. you can do this using um, accessibility, essentially, where you pick individual accessibility elements and yep. <laughs> uh, try to navigate your way through it. Uh, this this did, I found it very difficult to actually, yeah. um, <laughs> as much as I know about this stuff, like I still found it pretty difficult to actually get to the item that I wanted, especially in some of these sub menu table view kind of cases, yes. it can be pretty difficult to get the exact right thing. So totally. um, the one question I had before we actually dive into sort of you can demo what the app does and stuff was, um, I'm curious if you actually have support for um, uh, Automator for this application as well, because one of the interesting cases would be if you had a script, right, where you uh, did something in Apple Script, and then in Automator you could basically have an Automator action that would play back your um, automation <laughs> that, yep. that you do on your end, and that would uh, at least save some of these manual tasks. That uh, I, at least uh, Automator's like record me action doesn't really do that well in right. a lot of these right. cases, and so. Uh, I'm curious to see if uh, you've thought about putting Automator support into uh, your app or if you already have it. Maybe. Yeah, so we have something like that. So we don't have like Apple script support. It's something we'd like to do, but just, you know, doesn't feel like it's it's necessary for an MVP necessarily, you know, for an initial yeah. launch. Um, but actually something we added just recently at the suggestion of, of somebody I think like you and me, who's really into making all their tools work together um, is we have a, uh, a, a custom URL scheme. So we have a way for you to, for any any shortcut that you have open in Keysmith, there's a menu option to copy a URL that would run it. Um, so you can make this, you know, you can have Automator open this URL, which would effectively run run the shortcut mm -hmm. for you. Or you can even make this part of, you know, your own custom little shell script, or even part of the web, right? You can link to something and just an anchor with an with an href on the web and have it run some shortcut if you'd like. So yeah, we we do have sort of this this basic form of interoperability. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean yeah. that's about as as much as you really need at the end of the day, anyway. But yep. uh, cool. absolutely, yeah. It's yeah. nice, nice to see that uh, you could play along with it. So, yeah. all right. Uh, well, we'll stop talking about what this magical app does, and uh, <laughs> we'll actually uh, dive into demonstrating what uh, what it does, and you'll talk about sort of the problems that you uh, you tackled while you were developing it. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. All right. So here's Keysmith, and I'll let Daniel demonstrate uh, what it does. Yeah. So uh, like I said earlier, Keysmith is an app that lets you primarily create custom keyboard shortcuts for a series of actions. So anything you can do with your mouse or keyboard, you know, Keysmith should support as well. Um, so this is an example of one. Um, something I do a lot is I use Slack and I will respond with a little, you know, a little plus one thumbs up react she here uh, to to uh, my, my teammates. Um, so I've actually created a keyboard shortcut to do that. And I'll, I'll demonstrate how this works by just recording it and then and I'll demonstrate it. So I'll, I'll hit record. And then I go here into Slack, and there's actually already a keyboard shortcut for reacting to the last message, uh, and that's Command Shift Slash. So I'll do that, and then I'll start typing plus one, and I'll hit Enter, and that well, actually, it got rid of the react because I had already put it there. Um, but yeah, here we can see that uh, you know it's it's picked up all these actions I've done, including this this click here was just to activate Slack. Um, but now I've, I've already got this assigned, but I can come in here and say I want Command Y and then Slack only to trigger this shortcut. Um, so I can make this happen anywhere. You can do global shortcuts or you can just have it in a particular app and this one only makes sense in Slack. So now I'll just hit Command Y and we'll see Keysmith takes those actions I took there much more quickly. So it's kind of hard to, to see what's going sure. on. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a quick demo of Keysmith. Um, yeah. It can also oh, do kind it's of, one of. It's one of the nice okay. things actually that it goes that fast is one of the downfalls with automators that actually tries to go through like mouse right. movements sometimes and stuff and it, it can yes. be pretty slow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, of course, one of the the funny things about this is that um, in in trying to demo it like like we've just done or in our demo video, it moves too quickly to see what's happening, so it's hard to demo, right? Like that's a it's a it's a feature and a and a bug sure. in terms of uh, of of marketing. Um, but. Uh, yeah, just to, to show like one more example of a um, shortcut I use a lot. So we use Trello for project management and we use we use GitHub as well. And there's this feature that lets you in Trello, um, you can attach, oops, you can attach a GitHub pull request to a Trello card. 
Um, and oh, sorry, things are a little slow with uh, Skype doing the recording, I think. But um, no so yeah, here I've got a shortcut that clicks on that GitHub thing, clicks on attach pull request, and then um, you're presented with a big list. And here it's being a little smart. Instead of just clicking on the, the thing that I clicked on exactly, it'll click on the first item in the list because it's kind of aware of lists. Um, and so this is a way where, you know, it wouldn't be very useful to just click on the same pull request each time here. Uh, but this this addition of a little bit of smarts makes it makes it more useful for a lot of tasks. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's a that's another example there of what you can do. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, so we wanted to dive into a little code demo as well today, uh, talking about some of the accessibility issues that you uh, were talking about. Um, and so I'll let you uh, kind of kick off what you want to demonstrate with that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe a brief overview first is, uh, yeah, this this does use, like you had mentioned earlier, the accessibility APIs. Um, so it takes advantage of the same thing that like a screen reader would uh, to attempt to read the user interface elements on the screen uh, and, you know, click on them intelligently that way. Uh, so you're not just clicking at X, Y coordinates, you're clicking on the record button, you're clicking on the close button, whatever, whatever that may be. Um, and uh, you know, we ran into several challenges with this stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty clear right off the bat that a lot of these APIs are very old. Uh, the way you use them, there's a lot of like in-out parameters and things like that that, that, that feel kind of old school. And um, so that takes some getting used to. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about one specific problem actually we encountered. Um, and uh, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I am, I am an Emacs user, so I'll, I'll show you this in Emacs. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, one of the one of the problems we ran into is in attempting to identify windows. So um, you know, let's say you want to create a a shortcut in text edit that opens up a new document and types meeting notes and the current date or something like that. Um, uh, one of the things we attempt to do is if you if you first click on a window, uh, we want to also click on a window. And sometimes you need to click on a specific window. You want to click on the window that is titled meeting notes. Uh, and sometimes you want to click on whatever the frontmost window is or whatever the only window open is, right? There are various things you could mean. And um, so we want to do our best to try to remember this choice by keeping track of which window is which. So if you run the shortcut once and you click on window A, then we want to click on window A the next time you run it as well. Um, so this leads to the problem, and maybe I can create sort of a visual example by opening a couple text edit windows. This creates the problem that, you know, we want to be able to uniquely identify this window versus this one. Um, ideally, we'd love if this window had some sort of identifier, unique identifier, and, and this one did as well. And then we could just keep track of those. Uh, unfortunately, using the accessibility APIs, this, this doesn't seem to be a feature. Um, so when you, when you work with the accessibility APIs, um, you end up using this thing called, uh, I think I have it in here, yeah, an AXUI element a lot which is uh, a, a struct that represents some kind of user interface element in, in the accessibility hierarchy. And so this could represent a button, it could represent a list, it could represent a window, it could represent an application, right? For It, it, it stands for various levels of this hierarchy. So if you have one for a window, again, we'd love to be able to say, hey, AXUI element, give me your globally unique identifier, please. Um, but this, you know, alas, this, this does not exist. Um, however, there's another API, uh, the CG window API, um, that does have unique identifiers. So you can actually ask a, uh, a CG window for a CG window number, and you can see us doing that right here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into more detail here. Um, so we, <laughs> we came up with a solution that sounds really hacky, um, and it is, uh, but it ends up working fairly well in practice. And that solution is to um, gather a list of all of the windows for a particular element uh, and gather the AXUI elements for them, right? So there's these accessibility pointers to these elements. And then separately gather a list of all the CG windows for an application, which include uh, window numbers. Um, these are completely distinct. There's no way to say, you know, given an AXUI element, give me the CG window or vice versa. That's, that's not a thing you can do. But what we hacked together was effectively a way to do just that. So we attempt, we, we kind of iterate through each of these lists in, in parallel and say, okay, do your frames match up, right? Do you have the same origin and width and height and title and, and application <laughs> PID and things like that? Um, and again, in most cases, this works great, right? In, in this case, with two text edit windows, you can very clearly distinguish between the windows because they have entirely different frames. Um, and so that's what we do here. Um, 
sort of the entry here is this method uh, where we're asking for a window number for a top level window element, uh, which is an AXUI element. And this will, you know, optionally return an int. It's possible we, we won't be able to find anything for this. And, and so that's that's why it's an optional. Um, and what we do is we call this other help, uh, helper method here called possible window numbers um, that, that generates a list, right? Because using this kind of hacky method, um, it's possible we'll come up with multiple. So if I were to, you know, lay these text edit documents directly on top of one another, and for some reason they had the same window title, which fortunately here they do not, um, uh, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And yeah, you can see that I'm doing kind of what I described. Um, so we first grab the process identifier off of the AXUI element. Um, and then we gather a list of the CG windows. Uh, we, we ask for the currently active ones, the currently visible ones. And we filter the ones by their PID. So here we're using, again, kind of this old school API that, that clearly hasn't been Swiftified yet, which is, uh, you know, we're just given this this dictionary of string to any's here and we're asking for the PID and we're casting that with a with a bang, uh, don't at me, uh, with an <laughs> int here as an int. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're first filtering and saying, okay, get us the CG windows, at least for the same app. Um, and then we uh, filter the ones that also have a frame on them. Uh, these things aren't guaranteed to have frames, not sure exactly why, and we match mm. up the sizes, right? So we say, all right, find all the CG windows that are in this app, and then find the ones that match the size, at least the, the, the width and height of this particular AXUI element window we're looking for. Um, next, we say, all right, if we've only got one of these, then we'll, we'll hand that back. We've done our job. That's fantastic. And otherwise, <laughs> we then go through and find the distances between each of the CG window frames and the AXUI element frame that we're, that we're searching for. Um, the idea here is that we might be off by a pixel or two for some reason, whether there's some rounding thing going on. So we assume that the one that is closest is, is going to be the correct one. Um, again, this could fail in all sorts of ways, but in practice, we, we haven't seen it do so. Um, sure. And then finally, we you know, filter out or we, we figure out what that closest distance is and return the one that, that matches that closest distance. Um, cool. So, How does that yeah. work across app launches? Does that does that persist across app launches for these numbers, or is that are you regenerating that somehow? I'm curious yeah. how. Good, good question. No, it, it doesn't. So the CG window numbers are are regenerated. So um, the idea here is that if you're running a shortcut all the time with one particular window, then if you're not restarting between runs, we're going to remember the one that you chose. Um, so I I should mention as well that you know. If you ran some shortcut on these two text edit windows and we weren't able to tell which one you meant, we'll ask you. We'll ask you, hey, which did you mean untitled or untitled two? And then if you choose untitled two, we'll remember that choice in the future by doing by doing this here, um, by trying to grab an ID for that window. Um, gotcha. So yeah, does not persist across app launches. And I should add, we also have all sorts of other heuristics before we get anywhere near this that attempts to identify the right window as well. Um, so usually that catches things. This is kind of for our, our fallback fallback case. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Neat. So um, for the app itself, uh, did you end up using Swift UI for that? <laughs> yes, we did. Um, uh, I, had a, I, I had a feeling that was the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I downloaded the Xcode, what was it, 10 beta on day one of WWDC 2019 um, because I was actually developing just, just on the side an iOS app using React Native. Um, I, I've used React. I'm used to this declarative UI model, and they announced Swift UI, and I said, "All right, this is this is my future. I know it. You know, I, I recognize it immediately as as being like the future of UI development on uh, on iOS and macOS." And I, you know, it's got a lot of warts, but I absolutely love it. Um, it it really is fantastic. So yeah, this is uh, you know 98% Swift UI. There are those few really annoying edge cases you can't handle yet in Swift UI. And so we've had to fall back to an, an SVU representable and yeah, render with app kit, but sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, glad to hear it was a success. Yes. <laughs> yes. You make, you still make really cool apps with the Swift UI. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. Well, was there anything else you wanted to cover about uh, the app or maybe even about yourself or places people can uh, find you? Yeah, um, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, yeah, we we encourage folks to try out the app. Of course, uh, our website is keysmith.app, um, and uh, you know we're still actively developing this. This is something we use every day. We're we're really excited about it, and um, uh, our our target market is Mac nerds. So uh, I'm pretty <laughs> sure anybody watching this video falls into our our target market and would find a lot of value in uh, in this app. So yeah, probably we, we, yeah. 
yeah. I think you got twenty dollars from me at least coming your way. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but you know, it's it's just my buddy and I. My buddy's name is also Daniel, actually. So it's it's um just us two working on this. We're really responsive to feedback. We really love to hear it. And um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, I'll hopefully have you on again for uh, something else you work on. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and share it with your friends. Ways to contribute and additional information are in the description. I'll see you next week.